So today we are very excited to have um, three presenters um, present on this wonderful topic, um, collaboration between, between child and adult programs and systems that serve transition age youth. Um, we're going to start off with Marianne Davis. This is going to be a very collaborative presentation. We'll also hear from Marianne Sarkis, our colleague at Clark University, and also Nancy Koroloff out at Portland State. Um, so I think that's most of the housekeeping, so ho hopefully we could just kind of get right into it, and I'll leave you with Marianne Davis, who will start this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Good afternoon, and for those of you who are west of us, good morning. Um, we're excited to be here to talk to you today about this research that uh, Nancy Korloff, Catherine Sabella, Marianne Sarkis, and I have been conducting over the past five years. Um, this research um, has been funded from a variety of funders, um, primarily from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, which in the near future will be called the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, um, also from SAMHSA, uh, as well as some money from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. So today we're going to be talking about factors that are associated with programs that collaborate with one another. And the important aspect of collaboration we want to talk about are those that are collaborating across an age group that they don't normally serve. Um, so first of all, we want to talk a little bit about what collaboration is and sort of why we should be interested in it. So collaboration involves information exchange, modifying activities, sharing resources, and building the capacity of those who are collaborating for reciprocal benefits and to achieve shared goals. And there's a consistent relationship between collaboration and increased service utilization. Um, and so when you have programs that are collaborate, they are benefiting one another, and uh, in particular, when there are shared goals that can only be met by collaborating, collaboration is tremendously important. And one of the reasons that we were interested in looking at collaboration across the child and the adult system is that, as many of you know, when youth mature from adolescence to adulthood, they do this walk across a shift in our public systems um, that essentially we have organized typically into child systems that serve up to age 18 or 21 years, or they can then access the adult system typically starting at age 18 and up. And during ages 18 to 21, as you can see from this diagram, that they actually could be hitting on almost any of these services, but typically there's uh, uh, not very strong handshaking between this child system and the adult system. And transition age youth that we're generally speaking about being ages roughly 16 to 25, sort of in the middle of that, um, are uh, going to be accessing uh, both child and adult systems as they mature into adulthood. And so that handshaking from these systems over to these systems on the adult side are very important. Our previous research has shown that there's a lot of barriers to cross-age collaboration, and by cross-age, we're really talking about uh, programs or systems that are uh, collaborating with those um, in the ages that they don't serve. So for child systems, those are adult systems, and adult systems are the child systems. Um, and there's a lot of barriers to cross-age collaboration. Um, typically, they have different funding streams. They have different cultures and different approaches. Um, there are different agents of accountability, so uh, who pays you and who you are responsible for typically differs in the adult and the child system. Uh, people who provide services in each of these systems typically get trained in a different way. So we have tri child training and we have uh, broad adult training, um, and those trainings are quite different from one another typically. Um, and uh, maybe most important, other than the, the different funding streams, is that they have different target populations defined by age and the characteristics of those uh, populations then, which are partly defined by age, are quite different. So the ultimate goals of the research that we are presenting today is to identify program features that could be leveraged to increase cross-age collaboration. When we think about uh, research for let's say, psychosocial interventions. 
um, we are often looking for those factors that uh, therapy or other interventions could um, have an impact on in order to achieve an ultimate outcome. Um, this is pretty much the same thing that we're trying to do looking at these systems. We're looking at program features that could be changed to increase cross-age collaboration as the ultimate goal. We also want to be able to predict programs that would lead or would struggle with cross-age collaboration efforts. And in this case, when we talk about programs, we're talking about individual programs as opposed to broad organizations. So for example, a community mental health center might have an outpatient clinic. They might offer an assertive community treatment team. They might have a substance abuse program. Each of those, those are three different programs. Um, so we're looking at each of those individual programs features uh, in this case. So when we look to the literature about what might be factors that are associated with programs that could be correlated with uh, co collaboration, um, we went and took a look in the organizational psychology literature. And uh, a lot of the work there uh, looks at collaboration between at the individual level that talks about if you're going to put together something like a whole car, you might think of that as a whole person, um, that the individuals who are in the different functional units, like if we're talking about a car, maybe the engine assembly group or the trunk assembly group and the wheel attachment group, that each of those units of individuals need some overlapping responsibility to be rewarded or held accountable based on the collective performance, not just if you made a good trunk, but if your trunk contributed to a really good car. Um, they need mechanisms that make it easy for them to understand what each other is doing. So it's hard for me to figure out how to attach my wheels if I don't quite understand how the people in charge of the, maybe the axle is attached to the engine. You can tell my uh, knowledge about cars is not that extensive. Um, and then we also need clear procedures that foster that coordination so that people know exactly how to coordinate from one unit to the next. Now there's also some research looking at uh, more like human service systems that look at program characteristics that are associated with collaboration. Um, in previous research on collaboration, they have found that program, what we think of as demographics, how long the program has been in existence. Um, what are the, what's the number, the size of it, what type of service does it provide? Those kinds of demographics have been associated with collaboration. And then there have been a host of uh, program or leadership beliefs or perceptions that tend to, to add to collaboration. So um, when the program or leadership believes that coordination is important, when key stakeholders support coordination or collaboration occurring, when funders support collaboration or coordination, and when there's accountability, all of those factors have been uh, affiliated with or associated with stronger collaboration. So in the current study, uh, we want to look at the contribution of translating essentially those variables into programs that uh, transition age youth with serious mental health conditions could access in their local systems. So our data collection methods, we wanted to take a look in communities in which we felt confident that there would be an attention to the needs of transition age youth. Uh, and so we identified two sites that at the time when we started the research, uh, back in 2010 basically, um, that there were two sites that had received SAMHSA grants to improve their services through their Healthy Transitions Initiative, the HTI initiatives that were later renamed the Emerging Adult Initiatives. And then we also examined one site that had received one of the initial uh, SAMHSA funds to improve transition services, the Partnerships for Youth Transition sites. So these were the three sites in which we were examining program collaboration. For each of these sites, we had to identify uh, an individual in each of the programs in these sites that could serve as a key informant. So for example, say in um, site A, we may have had maybe 25 programs that were uh, identified as being part of the network there. We needed an informant, a key informant from each of those 25 programs. Data collection took place for the two HTI sites in the spring and summer of 2011, which was uh, towards the beginning of their initiation of their HTI activities. 
And then we collected data in the summer of 2014 for the PYT site, and that was about eight years after their grant had ended. We collected uh, our data using both phone and web interview. Uh, our recruitment rate was about 80%. And so part of our uh, data were collected via phone and part were collected via web interview. So the kinds of data that we collected at the program level was we were looking at um, factors that reflected those variables that we thought would be associated with collaboration. So we used, we took a look at the program collaboration practices using the index of interdisciplinary collaboration, which asked a variety of questions about how that program in their own practices within their program um, facilitated or or impeded interdisciplinary collaboration. So it had questions like, my colleagues from other professional disciplines do not treat me as an equal. That, of course, would not be encouraging of interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and other questions in there uh, get got at practices that would facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration. We also asked questions from a within and cross-program collaboration questionnaire, which got at some of the questions that uh, were suggested by the uh, manufacturing types of, of findings that I uh, presented earlier. So some items from that questionnaire look, were jobs in my program have overlapping responsibilities. You can see how that uh, reflects the, the different units of car manufacturing, for example. Or we have a good idea of how other programs work that we interact with, and that is uh, uh, that is with programs outside of your program. So for both within the program and external to the program types of collaboration practices. We also collected data about leadership beliefs or perceptions. Uh, an example of that is think about the 10 of the programs that are most important to your program and indicate the degree to which you agree with this as a statement. Leadership from those 10 programs as a group wanted to see my program coordinate better across child, adolescence, and adult services on behalf of transition age youth and young adults. We also asked questions about their involvement in the HTI project or in the Partnerships for Youth Transition project. So have they been, been involved in the grant activities? And then lastly, we asked about program demographics, the size and age of the program, the types of services they provided, and the ages served in age continuity. And this last item was important. Um, essentially because we needed to characterize whether the programs were child or adults, or in these particular uh, systems, we also had programs that were characterized as specifically serving transition age youth. So if they focused only on some smaller portion of the transition ages that extended between child and adulthood, for example, they might be a program that served 17 to 23 year olds, um, they, that was considered to be a, a transition age youth program. And with this, I'm going to turn this over to Marianne Sarkis to describe social network analysis methods. Okay. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about the uh, social network analysis piece of this project. Um, one of the nice things about social network analysis is that when you do network analysis, you make implicit relationships or patterns, um, especially in this context with collaboration, more explicit for visualization. So once you have a picture, you can understand the patterns of relationships a little bit better, and you could dig deeper into what is going on with those relationships, why are people collaborating or not, um, and who's collaborating with whom. So this is one way for us to assess the presence and the strengths of the relationships between organizations in a network. And it also gives us this really nice, robust um, analytical understanding through uh, various uh, statistical measures that we can use also for characterizing relationships in those broader contexts. So uh, when you look at a social network, just to give you a quick orientation for those of you who are, might not be familiar with it, um, when we look at a network, what we look at are a number of things. We look at the circles, or sometimes you see them as squares, triangles, whatever the symbols are. 
those are called the nodes. And the nodes are essentially the programs in our context. So they could be an individual, they could be a program, they could be an organization. Um, whatever you want to put in there uh, could be used. You can also look, you also look at the links between the two different um, programs. So between these two or between these two. So the links indicate that there is a relationship between two organizations. Um, the direction, if you see an arrow here, uh, means that this organization right here is making a referral to this in, uh, organization here. So this program is referring things to here. So the arrows are the relationships, and when you see this double arrow between uh, programs, that means there's a reciprocal relationship. So the two are making referrals to each other. The colors are also uh, often color, uh, they're coded uh, according to whatever criteria you're using. So you can use, in this context especially, you can use it in terms of the program served or the ages served um, or the types of services they might have, and we'll see some of that a little bit later on. So one of the things to keep in mind is the length of the line and uh, how far things are from each other here is relatively arbitrary, but this is an interesting way or it's an easy way for us to understand that these are closer relationships than this and this right here. But the length of the line really doesn't mean a whole lot. So that's one limitation to just looking at this and trying to make a lot of assumptions um, based on that. But in general, we notice that nodes or programs that are clustered together usually will tend to be closer to each other than ones who don't. So when, um, and you can also classify, you know, you could do this kind of organization to try and understand, you know, what are these groups of or programs versus these types of programs. So these serve uh, adults and these serve children. This is based on a previous study um, that uh, was done with 100 organizations in transition networks by Davis, Korolov, and Johnson. So I will look now uh, specifically at this study. So what we were interested in uh, in this uh, in the study was how often do staff in your program, these are the questions that we asked on our survey, how often do staff in your program meet with staff in this other program for client uh, planning purposes? How often do staff administrators in your program and these programs meet together to discuss issues of mutual interest? How often does your program refer clients to other programs? Also client from this other program. And how often does your program share resources? So those became our main uh, survey questions and we used those as a way to do the analysis. So when we did the coding uh, regarding the response, um, it was people or uh, uh, respondents had a choice of six questions, right? So not at all, really don't know. We assume that these ha are really indicating no connection, and then with these three uh, responses, uh, we indicated that there was a connection between the three. When we talk about specifically about cross-age collaboration, which is what we're interested in, uh, we classified each program according to the uh, ages served. So we had youth, pay, or adults. And we uh, defined cross-age connection as the connection with a program that serves a different age category. So for example, youth program refers clients to adult program. And then we came up with, uh, there is a measure called the EI index, uh, which is a common measure used in social network analysis to indicate homophily. Homophily is just a term for uh, birds of a feather fly together. So things that are uh, similar will tend to be with each other. So that's the ratio that measures between group linkages, which is in our context, uh, cross-age linkages in terms of all possible linkages. So it helps us determine the extent to which a youth-focused program, for example, tends to establish links with organizations that also serve youth as opposed to cross-age programs um, such as adults and K. And when we calculate the EI index, we look at um, the number, we took the difference between the number of external connections minus the number of internal connections or same age connections and divided that by the total number of connections. So here are the results. Um, in the next, next few slides, we're going to look at what each site looked like, looked like from a network perspective. 
so here is the first site. So as a reminder, the circles are programs. The lines are the linkages or referrals or collaborations. The size here is the number of outgoing linkages, right? So because we were interested in outgoing linkages, referral to other programs. And the colors indicate the program served. So in site A, you will note, for example, that the largest circles or nodes are youth circles uh, or youth programs right here. So we have these and right here. Um, and tend to make the highest numbers of referrals out because they tend to be the largest nodes as they are showing in this uh, chart. And, this, uh, and also we notice that Tay and adults don't tend to make as many referrals out but tend to be mostly re uh, receivers of these referrals which makes sense, obviously, in, our, in the context of our study. And notice here, just as we're moving forward, the amount of lines, the number of lines that are present within this network, and we're going to use that as a point of comparison for the next slide. So here is the next slide. If you notice, so going from site A to site B, immediately notice that there's a lot more linkages. So there's more lines than the previous slide. Four youth serving programs are at the center, these guys right here and uh, seem to be making the most amount of referrals and there are much more smaller programs on the margins and those tend to be adults um, um, adults serving and you do have some of the blue Tay uh, groups uh, or programs um, also circling or around the, uh, the the green nodes this means that the network is largely driven by what's happening at the center among the youth programs that are making those referrals to the other programs. And the other programs are not as integrated. So this is, even though there's a lot of linkages and a lot of links, it, the, you see that there's a lot more marginal programs that are not making as many referrals out. So while the number of the total links is much higher than the previous site, you'll notice they're largely driven by those central programs. This means also to us that there is some sort of unequal relationship among the various actors in this network. So the concern here is really what happens when you take out the central actors to the entire network, right? So if you're looking at this as a system-wide evaluation, you were only, you're not only interested in the types of relationships, but you're also interested at the roles that each of these relationships play or each of the program plays. So if one of those gets taken out, how does the entire network change? So the relationships between this program, for example, and this program will get largely um, uh, will get largely um, destroyed or will be removed because this program has to go through this program and this program in order to get to this program, right? So again, we're interested in system-wide linkages and this is one way of looking at it. This is in site C. Again, another comparison here. This is similar to the previous slide and we have the central youth programs right here that are making referrals to adults and TAE programs. And the TAE programs seem to be much more integrated rather here. They're much closer to the center um, than the adults, which are, tend to be more distant uh, with comparatively few uh, referrals out. So again, when we go back to um, the, the re results, when we're looking at the predictors of cross-age collaboration, coordination, now that we looked at what the network looks like, we're going to go back and revisit this EI index. So the EI index, as a reminder, we use that as a dependent variable, and it is the external internal index, uh, which is the ratio that measures between group linkages in terms of all linkages. And it tends to va range, uh, the, the values tend to range from minus one for perfect homophily, which means no cross-age collaboration, to plus one for perfect heterophily, which is all cross-age collaboration, and zero typically indicates uh, neutrality or balance. So in our study here, uh, we noticed that our range of collaborations, or the EI index, ranged from minus one, which is perfect homophily, there was no cross-age collaboration among the various actors, to 0.82. And our mean, which is, this is a positive, so it's closer to one, which is quite high, uh, the mean is 0.05. So um, next I'm going to turn it back to Marianne and she will discuss further the results that we found. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Sure. It's not often that you get to uh, present with somebody with your same name when your name is Marianne. <laughs> OK. 
okay. Um, so our, so uh, that was a, a wonderful uh, description of our dependent variable, so to speak, uh, which, is, which is that EI index is what we're going to focus on going forward. Um, and the first thing that we were interested in is whether the age group of the program was related to uh, the degree to which there is cross-age collaboration. Um, and what this figure shows you is that there's a very strong relationship between uh, the age groups served and the degree to which they collaborate with uh, programs of different ages. And what you can see in this is that transition age youth programs uh, really were the, the types of programs that were engaged in collaborating with uh, programs that served a different age group. Um, and so you can see that for youth programs, uh, the value was a little below zero, uh, showing uh, you know, close to neutrality um, and a slight tendency towards uh, uh, interacting primarily with youth programs only. Um, and the same thing for adult programs, that they tended to be around a, a neutral value, but also uh, it was slightly more in the direction of, of primarily interacting with adults. Where transition age youth programs um, very strongly uh, tended towards uh, co collaborating, showing all of those different behaviors as measured by those five questions with programs uh, that served ages other than the transition age youth group specialty. So if we go back just quickly to revisit those, uh, those networks with an eye towards thinking about the, the, the transition age youth programs are the ones that are connecting across ages, we can see that in this, uh, each of these next several figures, the transition age youth programs will be uh, green circles. Um, and in site A, uh, these two transition age youth circles are right, smack dab in the middle. <clears throat> this is a, a different picture from the first picture in that this is now limited to cross-age relationships. Actually, that may not be correct, that it's just cross-age relationships. Nope, because we do have arrows going between relationships of the same age. Um, so I take that back. My apologies. But these are, so these are the transition age youth programs in the middle with a third program here out on the periphery. And when we look at it, you can see that, uh, first of all, it would be difficult for transition age youth programs to only affiliate with transition age youth programs. There just aren't that many of them there. Um, and so they're, <coughs> excuse me, they, they are essentially um, interacting with programs of different ages. Uh, however, when we look at the adult programs, there's a tendency for them to primarily interact with other adult programs, although there are also some interactions with youth programs. Um, and the same thing with youth programs, uh, they may interact with each other. Uh, this one does not have relationship here. Um, and somewhat with adults. So they were more in the neutral area of not just um, uh, interacting on, uh, with, them, with other programs of the same age, um, but there was not a strong tendency to go cross ages. So this is site A, and this is site B. Um, <clears throat> Site B had uh, a, a larger number of transition age youth programs, um, but we see the same relationship where the, the transition age youth programs have relationships essentially with many of these other programs, which sort of uh, means that they, they are doing uh, stronger cross-age collaboration. And then this is Site C. Uh, in which you can see, uh, and for this site, this was the largest number of transition age youth programs and the largest proportion of them, um, and that they had relationships more strongly with other ages uh, than they had just within themselves. Uh, this might have been the site that we, you could have observed the, the most number of same age collaborations for transition age youth programs since they had more of them. Um, but in fact, uh, the transition age youth programs in this site also had very strong cross-age collaboration scores. <clears throat> we also wanted to look at whether the types of programs that were served, provided by these programs, so the services they offered, were related to cross-age collaboration. And so each of the programs answered a, a variety of questions about what kinds of services they provided, anywhere from outpatient mental health services to 
protective services within the child welfare system to vocational counseling. Um, and we analyzed uh, to determine whether any of those types of services had a relationship to the EI index. Um, and what we found was that uh, when we looked at it in a, in a uh, univariate way, uh, basically for each type of uh, service, we'll start off with residential, the first bar here, the question was, does your program provide residential services? And for those that answered yes, those are the purple bars here, their EI index was 0.33. So going towards the, uh, leaning towards more cross-age relationships. Uh, and those that answered no, which are the green bars here, being quite neutral. Um, and so uh, for each of the types of services, we evaluated yes versus no in differences in the EI index value. And there was a significant finding for these three types of services, residential, educational, and substance use services, where for residential and educational services, there was a tendency towards a, a significant finding uh, where they had stronger cross-age relationships. Um, the reverse was actually true for substance use services, where they primarily did not have cross-age relationships. Or uh, the programs that did not offer substance abuse services had stronger cross-age relationships, depending on how you want to view that. Uh, there were no other significant findings uh, for the types of services that were provided. We then, however, when you look at educational services and substance abuse services, if you think about the ages that are served in those programs and realize that we had such a strong finding with the ages served variable that we then wanted to examine whether some of these values were primarily accounted for them being predominantly either a youth or a transition age youth or an adult uh, type of program. Um, and so we then did regression analyses for each of these service types holding constant the age group served to see if these uh, findings held and what we found was that only the residential programs uh, remained significant when, after you held the age group served constant, um, in which case it was still the case that um, if you were a residential program, uh, it was, uh, that, that had an impact or was an a correlate of uh, your EI index value. Um, and, that, and in this case, uh, being resi a residential program accounted for 26% of the variance in the EI index value. So if we take a look at each site just to get a flavor for the residential services, um, residential services, as we know, are not that common. They're very expensive, um, for one thing, uh, and uh, they aren't that common. Um, so it's interesting that there was a significant relationship with the EI index Although, again, this may be in part because uh, you know, there aren't that many residential services, so perhaps uh, they uh, need to coll collaborate across a variety of, of uh, age groups served. Um, so we can see in this uh, figure that there are three residential programs. These are in pink. Um, one of them is a child, and uh, I'm sorry, one is a TAY program right here in the middle and two are child programs, um, and they had uh, collaborative relationships. As you can see, here's an adult to the youth program and the youth to the TAY program, and then um, we don't have a lot of relationships with other youth programs for this one. Um, the TAY program that was uh, residential, that were provided residential services, uh, has a lot of cross-age relationships, as you can see. In Site B, there was a larger number of programs that had uh, residential services. Um, and here we actually have youth, TAY, and an adult program that provided residential supports, um, with again the notion being that they uh, seem to have relationships with different age groups. And finally, in Site C, there were only two programs that provided residential services, uh, an adult program. Um, and right smack dab there in the middle, a youth program. Um, none of the TAE programs, transition age youth programs in Site C provided residential supports. When we looked at all other demographic uh, 
characteristics of programs. There were no significant relationships with the EI index, so the size of the program, the age of the program um, did not uh, have a relationship to the EI index. So then we analyzed uh, some of those other uh, variables, and, and in many ways we think of these as the more easily uh, possibly manipulated types of variables. Um, so if you can encourage a program to have stronger interdisciplinary practices or you can communicate clearly with programs from a leadership perspective what you want that program to do, uh, if that has a relationship to the EI index, then that might be uh, something that uh, systems change agents in the future could try to leverage to in increase the amount of cross-age collaboration. But disappointingly, what we found was that none of these had any significant relationship to the EI index. So you can see here uh, the interdisciplinary collaboration, within program collaboration, cross program collaboration, and per perspectives on system or, uh, or from the systems or of leadership were not significantly related to the EI index. And with that, I'm going to turn over the conclusions and discussion to Nancy Korloff. Okay, this is uh, Nancy Korloff. I'm here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, glad you all could join us and stay with us today. Um, so what does this all mean? Well, let me remind you that our ultimate goals at the beginning were to identify some program features that could be leveraged to increase cross-age collaboration. <coughs> and of course, that's really important to programs that serve transition age use because by their very nature, they need to be pulling on services from both the, the youth serving system and the adult serving system. Uh, the only strong cross-age collaborator variable that we could find was the fact that a program was serving transition age youth. Um, this may be because uh, transition age youth programs are small in number, so they have to collaborate in order to fill in for all the services that a young person would need. Um, and since it appears that the transition age youth programs are carrying the bulk of the cross-age collaboration, the question really becomes what can we all learn uh, from those programs. Um, even though we didn't find a relationship between leadership variables and the EI index, there was a relationship between some of those variables and overall collaboration. So it may be that there is still something in those leadership variables that can help us find malleable factors that will uh, increase cross-age collaboration. But at this point, I think we're really looking at the transition age youth programs to try to figure out um, who, who's doing it, what, what, a, what is a program factor about those that are doing a good job that we can tease out. Uh, can some of those program factors be replicated in other programs uh, in order to uh, increase cross-age collaboration? Next slide. So the next steps, and then we'll go into questions. So uh, be sure you have your questions ready. The next step will be we're going to look at change over time. And, and to remind you that these three sites were all measures at one point in time. And we do have... we can discern any malleable factors that uh, increase cross-age collaboration over time. And we'll also take another look to make sure that um, uh, the transition age youth programs are still the ones that seem to be doing the bulk of the uh, cross-age collaboration. Since the over time is really from the beginning of a grant period to the end of a five-year grant, it's possible that by the end of the five-year grant, the youth programs and the adult programs were doing more cross-age collaboration. Um, so we, we will be looking to try to uh, see if we can answer some of those questions. And then I think uh, it, it's pretty clear that the transition age youth programs are the ones who uh, have figured out how to do cross-age collaboration. And we need to find out more from them about uh, what they've done to make that happen. Uh, some of them are stronger than others, and so um, there's some variance in there that we can look at to see if there are, again, some things that can be taught to other programs to increase cross-age collaboration. So I think the bottom line is that we're uh, 
uh, we're, we're kind of still at the beginning in understanding how programs work together, collaborate together uh, in general, and uh, we're very much at the beginning in understanding uh, where transition age youth programs sit in this whole network of programs. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, open this up for questions. If anyone has a question that they would uh, uh, like to pose, you can just uh, put it into the question box. And while we're waiting for uh, um, questions to pop up, let's see. I think I see one. Hold on. I'm having trouble reading, Catherine. It's all on one line at a time. So the question says, collaboration often grows from funding that supports blended programming and cross-collaboration, having access to funding that promoted cross-age, a factor that was looked at. Was that a factor that was looked at? So the question is, were the programs that uh, seem to be doing cross-age collaboration more likely to have funding that supported that? Marianne Davis, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so we actually did not, uh, the, one of the um, questions that we asked about is what funders wanted from programs, which would be an indirect way of asking that question. We did not directly ascertain whether they had funding that, uh, like for example, did they have a contract that mandated um, uh, cross-age collaboration? But we did ask them about their uh, perceptions of what funders wanted, um, and that did not end up being a significant factor. Um, so you know, it's hard to imagine that a, a program that has it in their contract that they will do it wouldn't do it. Um, we don't think that's probably a very uh, common uh, element to put into contracts. Um, and to some extent, the, the fact that the transition age youth programs had the highest level of, of EI uh, index um, leaning towards cross-age collaboration um, would suggest to some extent that the, the, the funders, I would assume for those programs, would expect a fair amount of cross-age collaboration because largely um, when programs, when systems start with transition age youth programs, um, for example, in one of these sites, the uh, the only transition age youth program at the beginning of, of the grant cycle that uh, in the older site was the only transition age youth program in the entire system. Um, and that system eventually had uh, seven or eight transition age youth programs. Um, so to some extent, you could say the funders in, intended for that particular transition age youth program to do a lot of collaboration across the different sites, um, uh, not across the different sites, across the different ages. Um, but we did not ask specifically for folks to, to describe whether they had funding that encouraged it. Although we do, the HTI funding itself, that was a part of the, of the um, criteria for being funded, was a, to encourage a particularly collaboration between child and adult mental health. It was pretty specific. So in some ways you could say they all had that same um, incentive. Well, and actually, I think that's a really important point that they all have that same incentive. Yeah. So here's a, a, a different kind of question. I think both Mary Ann Sarkis and Mary Ann Davis, if you could respond. Do you think there's any value in continuing to look for uh, malleable factors in youth and adult programs? Or should, uh, should we just leave those alone and spend most of our time focusing on the transition age youth programs? I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, uh, and then Marianne Sarkis, if, if you have anything to follow up. I mean, one of the things that I think would be interesting, even within our data, would be to look at the youth or the adult programs with the highest EI indices, uh, because there's variability. So there clearly within those programs are some programs that have more cross-age collaboration. It was just as a category. They didn't tend to. Um, and take a look at, at the nature of those programs to see if there's uh, any indications of uh, when you're in a youth or an adult only program, um, are there any any indicators? I do absolutely think that it's worthwhile. Um, again, because there are some that are doing more than others uh, to 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 try to figure out what is it uh, that occurs that that facilitates them doing more of that. Um, you know, it, it's not only the TAPE programs that I think we can learn from. Marianne, okay. 
Did you have anything to add to that? I was going to add was, um, you know, we're still, at, as uh, both Nancy and Marianne have said before, that we're still in the initial stages of exploring how we can use EI, the EI index and social network analysis itself as a way to evaluate cross-age collaboration. So there's a lot of factors that we are currently looking at and trying to find out what would be the better predictors for us to be using uh, going forward. So again, it's still in the experimental stages at this point, but I think what we have indicates that this would be a good tool for us to be using, and it's just a matter of figuring out exactly what we need to be focusing on more than other factors. And, and actually, just to add to that, um, the, the uh, study that Nancy and I, with Matt Johnson, um, published back in 2012 that, that you saw one of the network analyses from, um, one of the things that we were able to do in that study, uh, because it was a longitudinal one, was when we got to the end of that study, we were able to talk to programs that were doing more or less connecting across the age divide. Um, and ask them what factors had contributed. So a little bit of a qualitative interview at that point, um, which is an opportunity we won't have with these particular sites, uh, but in our current uh, round of grant funding from uh, NIDER and SAMHSA, we have another project that will be using network analysis uh, to look at not just child to adult system connections, but also with the vocational rehabilitation system. Um, and we'll have an opportunity in that one to actually talk to programs that are that have that do more of it or less of it to get some sense of, of what's contributing to them doing more or less of it. So I would say we very much hope to learn more from both uh, youth adults and transition age youth programs going forward. Okay, this is a question from a state level uh, administrator who oversees uh, multiple age group programs. So what's the takeaway from a state for a state level person? What, um, what should they know or do differently to increase cross-age collaboration? That is a tough question. Um, I mean, from, these, from this research, the, this particular study, um, it's hard to give strong answers to that. Um, although I think, as you heard from Nancy um, in, in our discussion, I think we're still feeling that messages from leadership, and, and quite honestly, there was a statistical trend for some of those uh, variables to contribute to the EI index, so I think we don't feel like they're completely off the table. They just aren't nearly as strong as we would like them to be. Um, so, so some of the you know, consistent messages about the importance of it, certainly tying funding to having, uh, to, being, to demonstrating more collaboration uh, across the age groups. Um, I, it's hard to imagine that that wouldn't have an impact. Um, we, like I said, we did not ask programs if they had uh, in their contract or if their funding was dependent on it. Um, and quite honestly, sort of diving in and putting some transition age youth programs in there um, and then finding out from their perspective uh, what's getting in the way of cross-age collaboration and what's facilitating it uh, probably is a, a way to find out um, if, you, if you're already initiating some of these activities. The other thing to, I think that we now have, as opposed to when we first started this <clears throat> line of inquiry back in 2002, is that there have been a series of um, federal grants, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, out of SAMHSA to support uh, transition age youth programs. The, there were five partnerships for youth transition sites. Excuse me, trying to get rid of the frog. We've got a lot of pollen here in Massachusetts right now. <clears throat> and there were seven uh, healthy transitions initiative sites. Um, and I think a good number of them had a fair amount of success with uh, increasing the cross-age collaboration over time. Um, and I think you know, talking with some of the administrators from some of those sites would be, uh, no doubt, provide some, some uh, level of, of uh, guidance that we can't really capture with this particular piece of research. So I do feel like, you know, we won't be, uh, you know, research is the only place that we can learn things. I, I think that, uh, that the SAMHSA investment in these uh, various transition age youth uh, system transformation types of grants over time really has provided quite a wealth of knowledge. Um, but I do think that, that there's a cautionary note around, um, you know, it, it's not clear and, and that this is a difficult task. Um, we know that there are as I had said at the beginning, there are a lot of 
uh, barriers that uh, having different funding streams. I mean, we, we would hear about various things um, in, over the years from different providers about, uh, you know, one of these questions were how often do you meet with uh, individuals from this other program for client planning purposes? Um, and one of the things that we uh, heard a lot about was that, um, you know, you can't have two different care coordinators at the same time. So as a young person transitions from child services to adult services, uh, you know, they couldn't fund meetings between their current care coordinator and the care coordinator they'd have like in six months. Um, so those types of policy um, issues can, can clearly also get in the way. Um, and then some other pieces that we've heard about along the way, again, not so much through systematic research, but more through report. Um, I know in one of the sites that was the Partnerships for Youth Transition sites, they had policies that at least the providers felt that they needed, they could only have sort of, or they had to have certification as either a child or an adult provider. And um, Nancy, you probably remember this better than I do. I think that yeah. the, uh, the, the uh, county level administrators basically uh, require that all of the programs have both types of certification so that they could serve a wider age group. And, and then when, the, when they actually looked into the policy at the state level, in fact, there wasn't a, that kind of restriction, but it was kind of practice wisdom that had grown up, that if you don't have an adult certification, then you can't uh, ever serve anybody who might go from 16 to 21. Uh, and so that was a matter of really investigating and clarifying uh, the policy. But I think what Marianne is saying is, is what I would say, which is uh, at, at a state level, I think what a state or a regional level person can do is first of all call attention to the need for cross-age collaboration and, and, for, and support that it needs to be done and ask questions about uh, what's getting in the way. And then the other thing that's clear from this research is that at the, the transition age youth programs are the ones that are doing most of it. So I would go and talk with them about uh, what's, what are the barriers, what would help um, to see if you can't increase um, some of the, some of the cross-age travelation from other programs. So we, we are getting close to our time. Uh, are there any other questions? This would be the time to put them in. Uh, in the question box. Uh, Nancy, there looks like a new one, new question came in. Can you see it from uh, Michael? Um, I cannot see it. You want to read it? Sure. So it says, um, how about performance incentives for collaboration? The inclusion of collaboration often is another unfunded mandate for providers, which can be discouraging. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Nancy, do you want to, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I think partly what, uh, the, some of the things that you were discussing earlier, Marianne, um, uh, that we, that in, in terms of, we were trying to poke away at whether or not leadership or, or incentives would uh, increase cross-age collaboration. And, and uh, as Marianne said, we can, we've seen some trends there, certainly, it appears like maybe if the leadership are very clear that they support it, might be more likely to get it. But we really haven't, I don't think, gone much further than that. We do know that some sites that um, um, have put requirements for collaboration, as you said, unfunded, into contracts. And at least the anecdotal response seems to be that there is an increase. You know, tying it to some sort of a performance indicator would seem to make a lot of sense. Um, particularly if it's if it's more of a carrot than a stick, so that uh, you know I've um, talked with several administrators uh, about the idea of of whether there could be an additional pool of money that is accessed upon demonstration of a higher level of cross age collaboration or or that kind of work around the specific needs of transition age youth, so you get a bonus for doing it well. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, although I can't report on anybody actually having tried it and uh, reported on how well it was going. So, um, Michael, if, if you've got administrators who are willing to do that and, want, and would be willing to share that experience with us, we'd be really interested in hearing about it. Here's an interesting question about young adult uh, peer leaders. Um, and since there is a lot of emphasis currently on developing transition age youth peer support, 
Uh, we are in need of opportunities that gauge youth and develop their skills and interests to serve as young adult youth peer leaders. Is that an example of cross-age collaboration, or was cross-age was collaboration more broadly defined? So, so the collaboration in this case was defined by those five questions of the social network analysis, which was essentially how often do you meet with, with individuals in this program for client planning purposes, meet with them for other purposes, make referrals to them, receive, receive referrals from them, or share resources with them. And those were really the five, those are five global measures of collaboration um, and, it, and it's one of the most common ways in, in human services research to, to take a look at collaboration. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the formation of, of peer workers um, does not necessarily, it doesn't necessitate that you would have to be collaborating with programs of other ages to form uh, peer workers. Although presumably uh, a program that offers uh, like peer mentors or peer coaches uh, would hopefully be interacting with programs of different ages. I mean, particularly if it was a if these are peer mentors who are of transition age, um, then they would uh, likely that program would be classified in our system as a transition age youth program. And probably does show a higher level of cross age collaboration, um, but the cross the cross age collaboration itself is answering. Um, yes to those five questions, um, you don't have to answer yes to all five, but having answered uh, to, to the affirmative in some of those questions will give you a, a higher cross uh, age collaboration score when the program you're answering it yes to serves a different age. Um, so that, that was the very simple way that we measured it here. Um, and like I said, I, I think any uh, peer worker type of program um, for transition age youth probably would fall into the category of transition age youth programs that do collaborate across ages. I think we've come to the end of our time and it's uh, time to draw this to a close. Catherine? I, I just have one quick question because we missed it um, earlier. So Bill wanted to know if we looked at how policy barriers, e.g. SED versus SMI eligibility influence collaboration. I think that's an interesting question, and it's not something that we looked at. Um, do you have any comments on that real quick, Nancy and Marianne? Well, we certainly looked at policy barriers uh, uh, about eligibility, and in, in general, several years ago when we did that study, eligibility criteria at both the child and the adult system were fairly different and, and probably major barriers. Uh, we believe that's probably changed some by now. We, I don't think we've really looked at it in terms of how that influences collaboration. Would you say so, Marianne? Yeah, I don't, we haven't gotten to a specific level of that, but, but we have, I think, over the years um, seen that some of the programs that will uh, reduce that barrier, uh, essentially there was a state that uh, grandfathered um, anybody uh, who was receiving child mental health services into their adult serving system um, as long as they continue to need services. Uh, other issues arise at that point, such as the appropriateness and appeal of those services, but, but that um, criteria, I, I think, has to remain a barrier to, to being able to serve individuals continuously. Um, so I think it does make it harder to collaborate on, it, although, you know, at that point you need to make referrals if you can't serve an individual any longer. Um, and so there are some measures of collaboration that you would still hope to see. I mean, these youth systems that we looked at couldn't serve individuals beyond the age of 21, regardless of what category they um, had for their criteria. Um, and so, we, you know, we didn't see a lot of cross-age collaboration there. Um, so, I mean, aside from cross-age collaboration, I think it can't do anything but, but be beneficial to try to align those uh, eligibility criteria up so that people don't have to get booted out of services because they've reached a particular birthday. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Nancy, you, can, you wanna bring it home, close it out? So thanks everybody for being on the webinar with us. Uh, um, you're welcome to continue to send, uh, I think they've got emails for some of us, don't they? Uh, if you have further questions, you're welcome to email us, and we'll try to respond. Um, and we uh, uh, would appreciate your interest in this topic and think it's really got some, uh, some positive uh, potential for helping organizations.